Good afternoon. My name is David Plotz. I'm the editor of Slate. And on behalf of Slate and New America Foundation and Arizona State, I'm glad to welcome you to this Future Tense event. Um, Future Tense, as, as some of you know, is a collaboration among Slate and New America Foundation and Arizona State to examine uh, public policy and technology and how uh, the one affects the other and look forward down the road at big looming public policy problems and think about how technology can or cannot help resolve it or perhaps exacerbate the problem. Uh, today we have a great topic and, and excellent people to discuss it. The, topic for this afternoon is can technology save foreign aid and we're going to have two parts to the event first we're going to talk uh, with Jamie Zimmerman and Henry Jacklin about an article and some work that they an article that they ran in slate and some work that they've done about the idea of giving money directly to the poor using taking normal methods of foreign aid and instead giving money directly via electronic means to the poor and seeing if that has better results than traditional methods of foreign aid. And then after that, we're going to have a discussion with three other folks about the article and, and then more about how technology can change foreign aid. Uh, so let me first introduce Henry and Jamie. And I'm going to have them talk a bit about their article. And then I'm going to interrogate them about it. And uh, I'm in a fortunate position, which is, uh, well, it's, there are very bright lights here. They're, I'm in a fortunate position of being, of being relatively ignorant about the subject and enthusiastic about it, and also a journalist. So I look forward to sort of pestering them with questions, which hopefully will be a proxy for the questions that you will have. And then after I pester them with questions for a bit, uh, we'll have questions from you all, too. Um, so first, to my right, immediate right, is Jamie Zimmerman, who is director of the Global Assets Program here at New America Foundation, where she is focusing on asset building for the poor and increasingly looking at technology and electronic means as a way to help that. She previously worked at the University of North Carolina. She bummed around South America, trying to avoid the United States for a while, she said, <laughs> for mysterious reasons. Uh, <laughs> And then to her right is Henry Jacklin, who is the director of the private sector division uh, of the Partnerships Bureau at the United Nations Development Program. And he's a native of Brazil, although you will not hear that in his accent, and worked as a commercial banker in Brazil and has been working on microfinance uh, in particular for many, many years, and mostly in, over the past 20 years at UNDP. Uh, he's worked in South Africa, Bulgaria, Brazil, Paraguay, and he started the MicroStart program, which uh, directs $40 million to support early stage international microfinance. So I'm going to sit down and I'm going to ask um, you guys to talk about the article you wrote in Slate, which is called Money to the People. And then I think it's based on larger work that you've done. So, OK. Is this going? Yeah, I'll get us started. Um, so thanks, everybody, for coming. It's great to see. Uh, such a great turnout today, and I'm um, happy to be here with my good friend, Henry, who I've been working closely with on this idea, um, along with some other colleagues of ours for a while. I'm going to talk a little bit about the article, but also more broadly about the paper that the article um, accompanies, and it's that was available outside. It's called A Third Way for Official Development Assistance. A Third Way for ODA is a... Uh, a little more sing-songy way to perhaps say it, but uh, something. This this is the the meat here of of the the article, the substance of the article uh, that we did within Slate. So you know, just to give a little bit of background and, and an overview, because I know we want to not spend too much time. So I'm going to keep this at a little bit of a high level. But you know, the Global Assets Program at New America. It's really the focus is on breaking the cycles of poverty by providing the poor with the tools and products and services they need to not only get by, but also to advance and to grow their way out of poverty. Uh, it's centered on this concept of asset building, um, that people not only need income, but critically need, uh, need wealth. Um, 
perhaps more critically than income, actually, uh, to save, to weather shocks, to make investments. And basically everything we do is centered around how to make that happen as effectively and efficiently as possible. So we love this idea um, of a new way for ODA um, because it, you know, because it helps get at this challenge of how to uh, provide asset building opportunities for the poor by taking on th the momentum of three major trends. Um, one is conditional cash transfers, um, which are increasingly popular um, around the world. They started in Latin America, but now you see them really globally, um, which is providing uh, direct cash transfers to the poor on the condition that they um, engage in some sort of um, predetermined behavior. Uh, where they exist, um, though there's still a lot of research that's being done, but where they exist and where uh, we have uh, evidence, we see that these programs actually are extremely uh, powerful in uh, changing health behavior, um, uh, education behaviors, like actually getting kids into school, getting them their immunizations. Um, it has impacts on consumption, on labor uh, participation, and uh, these are really powerful, powerful things. At the same time, they're in many cases highly inefficient. They, uh, they're only the vast majority of them are delivered to the poor. These transfers are delivered to the poor in uh, in cash, um, armored trucks, people lined up around blocks. Not really, I would say, the most efficient way to do it. So this and the second trend is uh, is financial inclusion, and in particular, savings-led financial inclusion. Um, the microfinance field has really exploded in the last few years. You've seen a shift in trends from um, credit alone to the need for savings, uh, and this is. Um, is something that uh, that we find is a very positive thing. So CCTs and savings-led financial inclusion, um, and then the third trend, technological advancements. Uh, you put these things together, and I think you have a really powerful recipe for um, providing the poor with uh, the providing massively the poor with opportunities to uh, save and build their assets and out of poverty. So you have three trends and. I think from there you can get at solving what's, uh, a, very, what's a very old problem, and that's uh, problems of inefficiency and, and ineffectiveness of ODA. So you know, I'll, I'll kind of throw that out there as like the three components of the, of the idea um, and let Henry kind of pick it up, uh, and we can do a little bit of back and yeah. forth if that, if that would work. Thank you, Jamie. And, and uh, thank you to the New America Foundation and this wonderful partnership. Not only does it have this work that we've done together, but there's the colloquium, which will have a publication at some point, where 100 people came from around the world to discuss this interface between social protection, financial inclusion, technology issues. Um, I like the theme of, of this uh, uh, conference today, or this workshop, or this get-together, let's say. Uh, in the sense that, you know, cons you can have brilliant concepts, but there, if there isn't the technology behind them, the concept means nothing. So perhaps first I should explain that from UNDP, in the private sector division, what we focus on is the interface of private sector at the bottom of the pyramid, the bottom billions, whether you want to use David Collier's work or Prahlad. I mean, how interface business, how business can interface at the bottom. And in that equation, you have also the issue of consumption, of demand. And in, in my particular case, I, ha I would be remiss if I didn't say, and my Brazilian roots, you know, I'm a good gringo, but I'm also a good Brazilian. Um, I happened to be in Brazil when they invented the, the Bolsa Escola in the first instance by Fernando Henrique Cardoso. And there was a huge debate in his first uh, term, and it was in the second term that they uh, that they actually did have the guts, as it were, to introduce it, because in those days it was very controversial to even think this way, and, uh, but it was very obvious why they did it, because as they looked in Brazil, there's in the Constitution the right for every family to have what they call a cesta basica, a basket of food, basket of goods. But the corruption in determining what went into the cesta basica, the transport of the cesta basica, and the distribution of the cesta basica, which, by the way, usually had the local mayor, the local politician involved at the end, was huge, to the point of maybe 50 or 60%. Then they said, why don't we give them the money? 
And it's not as simple as that, as Jamie's saying. If you're going around with armored cars and delivering cash, it could be the worst thing you could do. And in the case of Brazil, they did have an articulated financial agent able to do this on an ATM card with women, uh, and this is what they learned from microfinance especially, using women heads of households as a mechanism. But then they added to it, why don't we make it conditional? Why don't we make it conditional to having the kids in school and the health? And in that, I saw a revolution in a country that I've been uh, born in that's one of the most, uh, you know, in terms of inequality, it's, it was a world champion. And this particular program now reaching 12 million people, 12 million households, I'm sorry, 40 million people, it's over a billion dollars a month, though President Dilma Rousseff now has raised it 20%, I believe. Um, and the cost of these transfers directly into these households is less than 3% because of technology, and it could even be less. Now, Brazil obviously is a case that you can't put into Africa, but Brazil has five countries in it. You know, the Amazon is very much as difficult as anything I've ever seen in sub-Saharan Africa. The northeast of Brazil, where most of our poverty is, is Sahel, essentially. And then the, our other regions have poverty very much like other types of poverty. So the technology issue is actually very central to it, because the financial manager of this in Brazil, the Caixa Econômica Federal, had found, uh, uh, had devised a very simple, uh, what you call a smart ATM, whereby you go into the local shop and in the cashier, he actually disperses based on your card and on a satellite it connects real time to an account, which can have very little money in it. Now, that's all very nice, fine, but the revolution that I saw was that when they made this conditional, the woman started saying, and let's, let's look at what the paradigm was before. Before, most of our policies, whether they're donors or governments, they look at the poor as victims, poor coitadinhos, as we say in Brazil, people that need all this. We have to give them training. We have The poor people, they really can't do anything on their own. And from that, microfinance, in a way, or microcredit, to be more honest, uh, and especially these transfers, conditional, take you into a citizenship paradigm. Because before, like with, the, with these uh, transfers or the Sista Basica, people were receiving gifts from the politician, and they thought the education was a gift from the politicians. They thought health was a gift from the politicians. But in fact, when it became conditional to part of their life support mechanism, then the woman started saying, but you know there hasn't been a teacher in that school? Why should I send, and you know it's a really bad school when there is a teacher? So there's a dialogue that begins that isn't very easy to have in a lot of countries because the poor are excluded in so many different ways. So this particular kind of policy began to fascinate me and I've been able to follow it from its beginning and I have the great fortune of knowing Cristóvão Buarque who was the first one who invented it and Fernando Henrique Cardoso named it uh, for the program that he invented and now it's a Bolsa Familia of course and then they've brought together a lot of the transfers. And then if you step away from it one step at a time you first you come down to the point that, well, what you're doing is you're guaranteeing minimum consumption. No, that's not a bad idea, you know. Why shouldn't you? Because poverty at some level is an absence of the ability to consume. And we're trying to teach them while they're hungry. That doesn't make sense. So this is not a stupid idea at all. And then you take two steps back after the financial crisis, and it becomes pure Keynesian stimulus because what has been going on, what has been percolating at the bottom of the Brazilian pyramid has done two things. It's changed the Gini coefficient at a rate that economists say is not very common. Mm -hmm. And secondly, it's developed a whole level of service and enterprise at the grassroots because this billion dollars a month is creating pure demand in the things that people need the most. So it's, it's a very powerful, but it's no panacea. But my hope is that someday people will look at it and say, it's no panacea, but it's a condition sine qua non. You really have to have this if you're ever really going to get out of poverty. I would never say that this takes people out of poverty, though in Brazil there is the statement that two million people have graduated, two million households have graduated. But, you know, even if they didn't, I, I would say that it's, it's not a bad investment. And I would never criticize it just, just on that level because you're, you're creating the multiplier effect we don't know yet, but there is some economic work going on in Brazil about what is the multiplier effect. I'm sorry, I think I've, 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 I've overstated the... Uh, Can I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step in here and actually interrogate you. Begin the interrogation. The lights, the lights, I can the, see it, yes. The, so this is a wonderful example that you've cited of, of a program in which the government is providing this assistance to its people. We're talking 
the subject today is, is foreign aid. So I'm curious about how, in the case of money that's coming from outside of a country where the decision hasn't been made by a national, by the national government, and in fact it's uh, perhaps circumventing normal, normal passage of money through a government, uh, you can have the same effect. Are there examples of a similar kind of transfer that's happening where the money is not internal to the government itself? Well, let me, uh, that's excellent, David. And the, the main thing I'd like to say about this, and, and it's a bit you know, uh, like uh, microfinance, so it's invented in the South. Both of these things are invented in the South. And poor Yunus, we should all be writing letters to the idiots in Bangladesh. But um, it, the matter of where the money comes from is really interesting because you have a wide range of countries, those that would not have the resources in, to do what we're talking about and those that do, and those that are in between that don't have quite enough but have some. And there's absolutely no reason why, you know, foreign assistance couldn't be channeled to those countries that don't have the resources, only have part of the resources, but more importantly, if it becomes part of a universal approach, and here's where technology becomes very important, and from my days in banking, this is, you know, what I believe, is that you can begin to have the common standards around the world of what, how you, how you transfer, on what basis, if you're going to have accounts, which I particularly advocate for basic transaction accounts as a global public good, um, I think that, that the role of foreign money could be an incentive uh, for a global approach. And I really think it can be a global approach because the logic of it is very powerful. If you can resolve the technology, if you can resolve the issue of the registration, if you can resolve the issue of the IDs, which constantly comes up as the biggest issue. And that is being resolved in big ways, in many ways, with, with different technological things. Yeah, and I don't have a whole lot to add to that. I think, you know, it's, I think it's important to say that you know, this is a provocative idea and we're not insinuating that this is necessarily happening yet or that it would happen without, you know, that it would happen very easily. I think there are some challenges that Henry just stated that, um, that we would, some hurdles we need to overcome. Um, I can't think of an example quite yet where you have, a, let's say, the United States is direct, directly depositing money into the account of someone in Afghanistan. Maybe that'll be happening one day. I think uh, you know the closest we have right now. Um, when we talk about a third way for ODA, what we're you know the, we have kind of simplifying it, but the first two ways really are government to government, government to other organization, institution slash agency of some World sort. Bank, UN, or, yeah, NGOs, whatever. And whatever. then and then from there it trickles down, and those trickles have many leakages, and that's what we're trying to figure out. How do you? get around that. Um, and I think the point really is, I mean, I think we'll see from the experiments that are happening in Haiti right now that I, that I know Priya will discuss, um, and, uh, and the momentum building behind cash transfers, behind financial inclusion, and behind mobile money will, will provide us with the opportunity to experiment with an idea like this and see really what the, the critical opportunities and challenges are and how we can how we can face those. But to answer your question, it's it's not happening as such yet. Right now what we the closest we have, I think, are transfers to organizations that are then divvying it out. Yeah. Um, yeah. Definitely. The uh, I'm one thing I'm curious about just as a user, as a crude user of technology, is the actual practicalities of getting money to somebody that they're okay, I'm giving you this is your cell phone. Mm -hmm. It's actually my cell phone. But pretend it's your cell phone. Yeah. How is that? How are you? Where does the money start? Mm -hmm. How is it getting here? How do we know that it's you that's getting it? Mm -hmm. And and finally, yeah. uh, and finally, what if I lose it? I what if you lose it? Do you want sure, you, you want. You yeah. go. Sure. Basically, you have a text function, right? You go in, and when you buy your units, it's it's a text function which then gives you a credit. That you can go into a store. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. That you can go into a store. I mean, all they're doing is using the text function and with a little code that the storekeeper on the other side is also keeping. So if you have a cousin in Nairobi, which is happening every day millions of times, who sends you $5, it's going to show up in a text. That text will go into a store because every store now in Kenya has one, and they will recognize that you have $5, and the storekeeper will say, oh, you want to buy something? 
because that's really what they want. No, you want the money? Well, here it is. It's as simple as that. I mean, I, 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 I'm oversimplifying it to a little bit, mm -hmm. but and you can go on the website in uh, Vodafone and see how the M-Pesa system works in Kenya, for instance. They've got a good little demonstration. But let's just say it isn't as complicated as you think, mm -hmm. and it's going on, and millions and millions of people have proven that it's not a big deal, and millions and millions of shopkeepers are proving that it's not a big deal. Not only that, they're proving it's a good deal. <laughs> and it's, is it, so there's sort of a, is it an actual bank account that I could then withdraw from? And could I make lots of, and lots of different people can make lots of deposits to this phone? Ah, now you in, get. Yeah. <laughs> in some cases, yes, and in some cases, no. Increasingly, what we've seen with M-Pesa, which, which is the mobile transfer service within Kenya, they now have started an additional service called M-Kesho, which is actually a saving service that's uh, tied with Equity Bank, and it is an account. So we, we're finding that it's increasingly easy to actually have, you know, what used to be more of a telco, you know, right. exchange of minutes um, as currency sort of functionality to now you can actually save money, um, withdraw money, transfer with between cell phones. Um, in a lot of cases, it's the SIM card on the cell phone that's the identifier. Right. Um, so that's how you know, and if, you know, someone, if you've lost your phone, um, someone's stolen your phone, you can go and have that SIM turned off. Um, and have it, and so there's this. That's one way in which you can uh, verify and you can track, and you. It's not just a random person with a random cell phone going in and saying, "I want my transfer." There are ways you have to have identification and verification, um, and that's one way that uh, that we're that they're getting around that. Uh, but you know, this is through cell phones and the and the banking agents like going right. in, like the shopkeepers that actually have a relationship with a bank, and you go in with your cell phone and you say, "I have." five pesos I want to put in, they, they give you a code, they, they take the money, they put in the code, you get a text message immediately saying it's there. And cash out happens the same way. So feasibly for ODA, for aid, you could imagine something fairly similar where you get a text that says your, your cash transfer has been deposited into the account as of now or will be as of here, you know, whatever. So th it is, th there are, the layers of compli of complications to it, but essentially it's as simple as that. In, in the case and actually what you, what you end up having is that uh, until they open the, the accounts, because you have a system where you don't have bank accounts and a system where you do have mm -hmm. bank accounts. Mm -hmm. So M-Pesa was invented with no bank accounts. So essentially people were holding credits and minutes as savings. And the central bank had to agree, and the banks really ganged up uh, to get the central bank to stop this because it was they saw it as competition but the central bank allowed it but in other countries they're not going to allow this I know this in Malawi they've already told me they're not going to do it in South Africa I think they're not going to do it that way either they're going to force accounts but mm -hmm. uh, you know by uh, and it wasn't invented to be this Vodafone which works with us in UNDP in another program where they've used this as a commitment on their work at the bottom of the pyramid they originally were going to do this as a B2B idea and so it's, it's been invented through spontaneity and, and creativity, like a lot of things. Mm -hmm. what, what is the difference between doing aid? Um, now I'm in the mic. Sorry, I wasn't before. What's the difference uh, in doing aid uh, this way, direct transfers of cash, uh, between that and microfinance? It's the other universe. I mean, th from the beginning in the early 80s when, when it started taking off, I've always questioned, you know, credit. You know, Eunice and I have always had a disagreement. I've always said savings is a human right. He thinks credit is a human right. When I think loans can be the worst thing you can do to a lot of humanity, as we've seen in this country. And uh, the issue is that a lot of people put too much expectation into the microcredit, the, the, you know, the, 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 everyone was going to be a self-employed. So the poorest really cannot and should not be subjects of lending. They are subjects that you can at least, if you can, now if, if you add a consumption level that gives them security, it's like I say, teaching people when they're hungry isn't going to make much sense. But if they get some security and they know that over time there's a $20 subsidy that comes into the household, they begin to be able to be creative. And then maybe they can even take a $50 loan and pay it back. So one thing does not exclude the other. One thing makes 
people, you know, able to be economic citizens, I call it. You know, but to be a real economic citizen, you really have to have an account. And an account is a difficult thing because of the cost transaction issues of people having $5, taking out 50 cents, putting in $2, mm -hmm. you know, those kinds of things. And that, that's a whole other discussion. I don't know if you want to get into there. Mm -hmm. But that, I think, as technology goes, and people are born with an ID like they're doing in India with Nandan Nilakani, um, they will have an account maybe, and that account will be like a global public good. It will be a means of people to transact, and there won't be any mystery to it. And then people will be able to progress uh, a lot easier. Yeah, the only thing I would add to that really is, you know, when you really dig into the demographics of microcredit, if that's what you mean by microfinance, because there are a few different uh, definitions out there. You know, really, the poorest of the poor are not reached really by microcredit, the poorest of the poor. Um, and so I think this is what we're talking about here is trying to target those who, who even microcredit can't reach and do it in a way that really brings them in, in into the formal economy. Um, and provides them access to the economy and to society in a, in a way that other informal systems really can't. And actually, that gets to another point I was curious about, which is that you, you talk about the poorest of the poor. So are we at a situation where the poorest of the poor now really do have cell phones? Is it so that, so that it's that universal? That's wonderful. Yeah, it's, 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 it's certainly getting there. It's, you know, I wouldn't say it's universal now, but it certainly surprised everyone. But surprised everyone how companies have also been innovative enough to create. It's one of the cases where technology has really been used to get better and better at reaching markets below. It's one really strong case, as you see, and how they did the, the prepaid phones. And a lot of these things that were invented overseas now are used in America, you know. Uh, but it's, it's, it's very much getting... And to the point, like in, in UNDP, I, I argue in, in crisis areas that the cost of the cell phones are so low now that, especially in, in civil war and uh, places like that, phones should be given because the benefit of people having a phone in many ways exceeds the cost to governments and to whoever else. You know, whether it's having women being able to you know, text you that there is a problem and someone's coming and the violence is coming back to my neighborhood, or the fact that you might be able to uh, underwrite minimum consumption to get the economy going again. Um, I think they're going to be, you know, a fairly free good at some point. Not that's, now. But that's a future. fascinating idea. I, so we're, we're, again, we're talking, the subject is foreign aid. And, and traditionally, when people think about foreign aid, they think about large-scale health programs, perhaps, mm. or you know, building, investing a huge amount in infrastructure. Uh, is the, the kind of aid that you're talking about using technology to send money directly to people, is it, are you saying that the other kinds of foreign aid, we should just scrap it or severely cut them back, and that this will, uh, this will be an adequate or in, uh, improved mechanism? Or uh, are these other kinds of aid, can, can you do these other kinds of aid using this kind of technology too? I mean, is this a way to get, you can get people vaccinated this way too? I think you probably could, at least vaccinated. Well, if it's conditional yeah. transfers, that's what they do. They say your children has to be, you know, vaccinated and your kids are in school. Right, and you get your transfer on the condition that they, that they do those things. But to answer your question, um, no. Uh, we're not arguing that this should right. replace all other forms of, of aid or that this is any sort of panacea to poverty reduction. Um, what we're arguing is that there, that there is an increasing acknowledgement that uh, aid in its current forms has a lot of problems um, and that we need to think creatively about new ways, the aid that is meant to actually reach the poorest of the poor. Um, in this way, that we need to think creatively about how to actually make that happen in a better way, um, to you know reduce the co the costs associated with that aid. Do we think that this is going to solve problems of infrastructure and build roads for people? No, um, and those are things that also need that need to happen. <coughs> One thing on the flip side of that, however, is we would hope, as Henry was saying, the citizen ship paradigm that he thinks that this uh, that these types of transfers conditional cash transfers would cause where there is a now a demand for better services um, and for better goods that that may in fact be a 
a reinforcer of the other aid, um, hmm. the other objectives of aid um, that are out there. So, you know, perhaps it's a way to you know, boost uh, the other the other things that are happening. But but we're not arguing necessarily um, that all other aid should be right. scrapped right. Um, and this should be done instead. In fact, what we're really arguing is just someone experiment with it um, right. and try it out and see, you know, what does it really does it work? Is it more efficient? Is it more effective? How can we couple it with other programs? How can we make it work well? It's a very new idea, um, so it's not really, you know, there, there's, we couldn't argue replacing anything yet, but, uh, but yeah, so I think that that's really what we're, what we're getting at but, here. But I would add that, you know, the title of this was also meant to signify that if you take the commitments that all developed countries have made of 0 0.7, I believe, of GDP, uh, and you look at what actually goes, there's a gap. And we know perfectly well, and it may be, I think, as much as $100 billion, I, I forget, mm -hmm. but it's about $100 billion a year in the theoretical commitment that's not met. And there's no way that the governments will be able, especially in America now, uh, to up their aid because they're not seeing the impact that allows them to go further. Now, if such a program existed on a, on a scale that is in the hundreds of millions of households, the constituencies that could actually activate that money in the North could be very powerful. Why? Because they're recognizing that the spin-off effects, the collateral effects, the ability to get billions of people into the market consuming, and all of the trickle-up effects, you might call it, make it one of the better investments. So you may get big lobbies of, like, food industry going to Congress and say, you know, that particular program makes a lot of sense to me, Congressman. You know, I think it's, it's, got, it's got dimensions to it that make it very clear. And it goes all the way back to the, 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 the huge generosity this country has and all those people out in the Midwest that, you know, will send their $50 for a family, I don't know where, you know, that kind of vision that people have. But this is far less paternalistic, as I think one of the comments was saying. Isn't this just paternalism? No, I think it's the opposite, the opposite shift, because as Jamie said, we have found out more and more, and why was microcredit, and I'm sorry I don't say microfinance, but it never really was able to do the saving side of it. Now we're doing it. Um, but, but, but that was the one thing that people said, oh, well, that's getting down to the bottom of the pyramid. That's great. But it's very difficult. Uh, to get aid to really interact at where it's needed the most because of how societies work. And this society would be no different uh, than the present. Uh, can I interrupt yeah. you here? Because you raise an interesting question. And this is sort of a sales pitch to to the funders, at least in the United States, who, are, who supply well, taxpayers. the taxpayers. <laughs> well, the taxpayers <laughs> supply it, and then there's a, this whole eating intermediary industry here in Washington that controls what comes in and out. But the... So I think the interesting thing about microcredit and the reason it had it captured the imagination of so many Americans in particular was this notion that it undergirding it is some form of capitalism. That yeah. what you're doing exactly. is you're subsidizing exactly. people's entrepreneurial zeal. The, I, the, the conceptual difficulty I'm sure you, that you guys have thought about this that you face when you are giving cash transfers to people, at least in terms of selling it to, say, a Republican House of Representatives is, isn't this just giving a whole bunch of money to poor people to do nothing, they get they just get it just because we're taking money that should be American, you know, be going to Am Americans, and we're giving it to a bunch of poor people elsewhere, and they're going to squander it on you know banana liquor or something. Well, I, I would say that that you know, and that would be the problem, and they're trapped in what I call the victim paradigm. That these are these are useless people. That you know, if we give them money, uh, he, President Lula, who's very famous as being you know, he's been a great part of his life being a Marxist Leninist. Uh, when he came to office, they almost changed the whole program in Brazil to ask for receipts because there was a whole group of people who says, well, they're going to go out and buy cachaça and cigarettes. Mm -hmm. And you see, you, then you get into the victim paradigm that you can't trust them. And what's right. microcredit, the great, 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 great power of microcredit was to prove that people in the poorest levels have a very complex, and if you try to document the life of a household and the different kinds of activities they have to do, to survive and how it works. I mean, the Diaries of the Poor that my dear friend uh, Stuart Rutherford was part of doing is a groundbreaking thing. For those of us who've worked in this forever, the one thing you always walk away with is saying that, you know, if people had 10% of the access to education and capital I've had in my life, they'd be millionaires because the way they survive day to day is amazing. And if we can give them that last oomph 
they could take off. Now, they may not believe that in the beginning, but as these things, as they are in Brazil, because when Lula tried to change it, the middle class of Brazil objected. They said the program makes sense. They bought it. And it's a highly taxed country, by the way. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that, that that is the natural first, it's dependency. The more important one is, well, then governments will use it as a means of buying votes. That's one that really needs to be looked at. And that's why how you calculate the payment and how you have checks and balances as to how much people should get is really very, very important. But it's a bit like FDR when he did Social Security. You know, people really, a lot of people like the government because Social Security was giving them something. Which, by the way, is what one of these things is, that people start seeing the government as something that isn't just there, it's, it's something that's actually interacting with me. You know, so it's, it's not easy. But I think it can be done, but, you know, but like we say, and Jamie's very good at, at, at pointing this out always, is that you don't do this big scale immediately. You build it, first you build the consensus in a constituency that can, that can critically look at it and analyze it and prove empirically that we're not just dreaming. And that's why Braz Mexico has some inf uh, experience in Chile too, but the Brazilian one is really the biggest in terms and the diversity of it allows you to analyze behavior very clearly. And I would just add really quickly that, you know, because we, this is something that we face a lot, even especially in our domestic asset building program, where we do actually go to uh, Republican congressmen and senators and talk to them about you know, savings and asset building opportunity for the poor here in the United States. Um, you know, I look at this, uh, uh, one just quick thing is that conditionalities are sexier for politicians. They like that if you have conditionalities, they just think that that, you know, that helps them sell it. Um, so, you know, I think that they actually work too, so that's a benefit. Um, but in my mind, it's really, it is a win, win, win. Like it's, it's a, and that, and how I would sell it to a politician, a policymaker would be this way too. It's a, it's a win for the individual when we, we have a number of different ideas in the back of this report for different ways in which you can yeah. incentivize savings, incentivize asset building for different, um, for, by gender, by livelihood, by age, and all of those things. And it's, so we have some different ideas for how to go about that in a smart way. Um, but in a win for an individual who can now have access to a formal bank account, who can save and manage their money, who can make investments in their own personal or human capital or that of their family, um, and, it's, uh, and now have actually access like legal access to society which a lot of people a lot of the poor support don't have it's a win for the financial institution if we can get the costs structure right and the costs down but a win for a financial institution that now has you know in many countries and those of uh, those of you in the room who work in microfinance know this um, financial institutions and MFIs are really trying to figure out how do we bank the bottom of the pyramid how do we get savings accounts to the bottom of the pyramid um, they're really trying they want to reach that market niche and figure out how to do it, well, here's an influx of capital for you and automatic bank accounts for an entire market of people. Um, that's not without complications, but I think that eventually that it'll be as almost as simple as that. And then it's a win for the government who now, instead of having to you know, spend 30% of, uh, of the cost of that bucket of aid, delivering it to the delivering cash transfers to the poor, administering their social protection schemes, now can do it for 3% like they were doing. And they actually have a way to monitor, they have a way to um, evaluate. And, uh, and so from, I think from that perspective, it's really effectiveness and efficiency, but it's not, it's not just a handout. And it, and it bolsters the private sector, it bolsters an individual's ability to progress. This, that was great. Let's have questions. So uh, is there a, do we have a mic or do we, are we not doing a mic? We yes, do. there's a mic. Okay. Yes, sir, right here and there's a mic coming up to you. Thank you, Raghubir Goyal, India Globe in Asia today. Um, what uh, message do you have as far as the White House is concerned? Because today they are having, uh, they had at the White House uh, as far as this, this is concerned about the economic problems and how to reach the people. My question is that uh, one in the past terrorists were using or misusing the funds like through uh, the Swiss banks where you cannot find how much, who has the money in the Swiss banks how this technology can be misused by the terrorists and also first mm -hmm. you have to educate the masses of people in those countries where this technology will work because not many people even today knows more than basic uh, just looking the cell phone. Mm -hmm. 
Do we need to take a couple or go ahead and address? Just go ahead. Just go ahead. Which one do you want to take, terrorism or? Well, the terrorism one is, is one that does come up, and when you bring it up, uh, it, it says because if you're talking, you know, let's assume it's $20, 30000000000 billion a year that's going this way, then there's the issues about how do you preserve, how, how do you control? And you see, that's where technology is the fundamental, because if the design is the best design, uh, the, a lot of systems have been used to bank up the pyramid. Very little has been done to really bank down the pyramid. Every time you touch your screen, for instance, there's a huge amount of transaction things going on there. But if you have a simplified system, your ability to actually have meaningful control over hundreds of millions of accounts that are receiving 20 or $30 is very strong because there is, there is an origin and there is a deposit. And so there could be schemes, but the schemes would have to be gigantic with such collusion that they'll be very difficult. So I think the technology will provide a way. As far as educating, I would say that MPESA has taught us what the poor have always taught us, is that if it's appropriate to them, they don't need training. They learn it. Nobody tra trained anybody for MPESA. And I will be honest, I couldn't do an MPESA transaction off the bat in Kenya. That's why I say, you know, but millions and millions and millions of people, including illiterates, are doing it. Next question. Uh, yes, sir, right here. Good luck. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm Stephen Schafferman with the U.S. Basic Income Guarantee Network. Mm. And I just spent this past weekend in New York City uh, with uh, Senator Eduardo Matarazzo Suplicy. Oh, who he's a, a dear friend, yeah. Yeah, he's a dear friend of mine also. Yeah. Uh, Suplicy was one of the co-founders of the Workers' Party with uh, President with Lula, Lula. Yeah. and was reporting on the Bolsa Familia and how it's going. And Brazil uh, now has a law that Suplicy sponsored saying that everyone has a right to a minimum income. Minimum income, yeah. Um, I just want to share another thing that we were talking about is an example of what you're suggesting. Uh, in Namibia, the Basic Income Earth Network helped organize a program that's run over the past three years in the village of Ochivara, Omitara, where they gave everyone an unconditional $100 Namibian a month and then closely tracked the results and found a significant increase in school attendance and uh, significant health benefits, a rise in entrepreneurship, and are hoping that this could be an example to Namibia and other countries. Uh, there's been a number of mentions of government funding such programs. Uh, there are also groups like the Gates Foundation, which could fund at least a big experiment. Um, in Namibia, Initially, it was set up where people had an ID card with a thumbprint and a van came around every month and handed out cash, and then they switched it over to a banking system. Mm -hmm. uh, Great. Thank you. Good. Yeah, um, absolutely. And that, I think just as you're going to the next person, you know, we're not debating you know, the merits of basic income guarantees here, but presumably a system like this could be a supporter of something like that if... It was of interest. Yeah, they certainly pretty. live in the same space. Yeah. Yes. Like I've said to, my, uh, to Eduardo all the time, because we've had many debates about it. But the problem is that the inequalities in Brazil are so high that saying something for everybody in Brazil is a problem. You really have to deal with the bottom, you know. But um, he's a great man. We're going to do two more questions, and then we're going we're to uh, have another session. You'll have more opportunities to ask. Yes, uh, ma'am, right here. I'm just wondering about effects. Um, have you seen any studies or conclusive studies, whether it's on transaction costs, whether it actually does reduce? I mean, the logic is, yeah, it would, but does it in effect does so? And also on uh, livelihoods and actually households. I mean, the gentleman here behind me mentioned that there was, you know, given the conditionalities that there are actually results. I was just wondering if you have seen any conclusive studies on the ty different types of effects and spin-off effects. Um, thanks. Sure, sure, absolutely. Um, you know, in terms of transaction costs, we do have some, we do have data on that. Um, in though, this is n not that, um, and I want, might not remember off the top of my head. But when they, when it, with Bolsa Familia, when they did switch from uh, switch to e-card mechanisms for delivery, the costs went down by some, I don't know, all fifty. 
15, 20 percent. At least. But, you know, so obvi for, for tr in terms of transaction costs, the difference between the difference in cost between delivering cash to a person who lines up and, and, and delivering it via an electronic means is really night and day. Um, in terms of actual impacts of cash transfer and conditional cash transfers on households and on individuals and on and on livelihoods and they're actually I would I won't go into detail because we have um, you know not that much time left but you know, just a few things that I had jotted down that the uh, the Progresa which, or Opportunidades which is the CCT program in Mexico which is another huge one it's almost as uh, big as Brazil um, the CT, CCT program itself was correlated with reducing poverty by 8.2 percent um, and the poverty gap by 23.6 percent and the severity of poverty by 34.5 percent um, and that's just kind of the macro level and there we do detail out um, in this report and in some others that you can find on our website um, more information on the, the impacts on health the impacts on education the impacts on participation in the labor force on consumption and in some cases actually on savings and investment though that kind of data is harder to get at or at least the researchers haven't really done it yet um, but I think that's why you're seeing this explosive growth of CCT programs because the re because the results on impact of impact evaluations that are coming out are showing such positive impacts. Uh, last question from this mustachio gentleman. <laughs> Thank you, Ramon Del Bono, the Scale Group. Two short observations uh, regarding historical antecedents. The Inter-American Foundation started experimenting about ten years ago, uh, uh, electronic transfer experiments in northern Argentina, in the border region between Argentina and Bolivia. You might want to check it out in the region of Abra Pampa. Uh, and I'm also pretty sure that they had a similar experiment in Brazil, I believe, in Recife. And you might want to check with the Inter-American Foundation as to antecedents. Oh, yeah. Second, as to the sources of the government, the danger of the government providing the funds, the political danger is very real. And of course, in, uh, international sources can also supplement them, but don't ignore the private sector. Mm -hmm. There are networks of corporate foundations and givers very interested in the connection between this kind of funding and the, the, the development of a democratic citizenship. You might want to check the Inter-American Network of Corporate Foundations, which is all over Latin America. No, we know them, yeah. And, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm just working in, in the state of Chihuahua in Mexico with the Federation of Chihuahuan Enterprise, which is might be also be very receptive to this kind of thing. Thank you. Great, thank you. I wanted to say something. There's this, in terms of Brazil at least, the graduation of people out of poverty has been unprecedented. How much of it is Bolsa Familia and how much of it is the fact of the economic growth and the low inflation, which is historic for us, is hard to say. But anyone who looks at it says that you could not ignore the effect of Bolsa Familia. So the causality isn't as elegant as you might like. Mm -hmm. But I think in Saba, correct me if I'm wrong, was it Gates that did an analysis in India where if they used all the existing programs that they have currently, no new programs, just the existing programs that they have that have some form of transfer to their population, they could save on an annual basis, was it 20 billion? It's over 20 billion dollars a year in India if they adopted these kinds of things that we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you're talking about a radical, government should do this just out of good business, <laughs> you know? Uh, it's, it's not, you know. All right, Henry and Jamie, that was, fascinating and we're going to hear from you again and after our next session we're not going to take a break we're just going to roll roll right into our next session where we're going to discuss some of the ideas we just raised thank you thank you thank you very much I'm doing a, I'm going to just say like a few words, introduce you guys, and then yeah, the government. we'll roll it. <laughs> um, okay, no, thank you all for staying quiet and orderly. We'll give you cash, there will be conditional cash payments for everyone who doesn't move and stays in your seat. Exactly, there will be wine and beer, but only if you behave yourselves. Um, so the second half of this, uh, this discussion today, this be in is um, global development, isn't there an app for that? 
And uh, I just want to convey a wonderful thing that Andres Martinez, our New America's uh, Fellows director noted actually he and he sent me an email about this, which is he was walking by the Peace Corps building uh, on around the corner on 20th Street and he noticed there was a huge photo of a schoolhouse and some kids in the developing world and the gigantic caption on the photograph was there's no app for that and so today we're going to debate the question maybe there is an app for that <laughs> and uh, joining us are we have uh, three interesting thinkers we have um, first the one I know best Charles Kenny who is a senior economist for the World Bank. He's a Schwartz Fellow here at New America, a contributing editor at Foreign Policy. He has a new book which comes out, which came out today, today or yesterday, <laughs> called Getting Better, Why Global, but Global Development is Succeeding and How We Can Improve the World Even More. Uh, and congratulations. The book is great. I've had a chance to look at it. Charles and I are debating what part of it might go in slate. Um, and I've, I've known Charles on and off for 20 years. Um, it is 20 years. We used to, we, in, back in the early 90s, we were both younger and, and had more hair. And we were in the same sort of circle of young SICE and World Bank folks, which I, Charles there because he belonged there. And I was there just because I was courting the woman who became my wife. Um, but he, uh, he's, a, he's a delightful person and a delightful thinker. Um, to his right is uh, Priya Jaisangani. Jaisangani. Jai, yeah, yes, got it. Got it. Uh, who's a senior advisor to USAID. And she's, um, she's leading the agency's effort on, on mobile banking and, and using and mobile, uh, mobile technology and development. Um, and she also worked for five years at the Gates Foundation. And she led the team that was responsible for that foundation's uh, microfinance efforts. And she also helped launch uh, the, the Kenya um, M-Pesa effort that we've heard so much about, which maybe she'll tell us even more about today. Um, and then to her right is Eric Worker, who's an associate professor at Harvard Business School, who researches the macroeconomics of development. He studies corruption in particular in government lending, which is some, a subject we didn't really talk about in the first session, which I really hope you will talk about now. And uh, he is, he's sort of working to restructure the impractical distribution of aid. And at the moment, I believe he is on leave from Harvard advising the president of Liberia on economic development which perhaps he can, he can talk a little bit about technology and that. So uh, welcome to you all. And I'll, so I'll, I'll, now I'll move down here. Um, <laughs> so they're going to, there's an app for that question. So if we look in North Africa and, and across the Middle East uh, right now, there apparently is an app for, for uh, revolution and political change. So uh, is, there, is there something similar? Is, is Going back to the, the overall subject of the previous panel, is the idea that technology can, can really change uh, how foreign aid is done, is that realistic or is that some kind of sort of utopianism um, that, that uh, people are holding on to because they, you know, people always think technology will change things? Uh, Charles, take it away. Um. It's, it's not utopianism, indeed. It's, it's been happening, and it's been happening lots uh, for, for many years. I mean, uh, think of a technology of, of vaccines um, and the role that aid played in enrolling out uh, vaccines against smallpox, which nobody dies of anymore. Uh, last century, <coughs> 300 to 500 million people died of smallpox, so this century is going to be a lot better that way anyway. Um, uh, it's played a role um, in... in uh, so many different ways. I mean, um, um, uh, not just across health, but um, also you know, new transportation technologies, the rubber sole, uh, the uh, uh, the bus, um, uh, all weather roads. Um, technology just is central to improving the quality of life in every country around the world. And a good deal of aid has been about trying to get m more technology into developing countries. Um, that's not to say two things. Um, uh, it's not to say that technology is the be-all and end-all. Um, and indeed, I think you can see that it can't be the be-all and end-all because we've been so successful um, in spreading technology around the world. Um, there are more computers per unit of, uh, per dollar of GDP in poor countries than in rich countries, and yet poor countries are still poor. There are more flights taken in and out uh, of, uh, of countries per unit of GDP in poor countries than rich countries, and yet 
poor countries remain poor. They've got a lot of technology, they remain poor. So there has to be more to the story than just technology. And um, you know, the, the hackneyed economist in me will say, it's institutions, it's a story about um, you know, governance and how that works. Now, as David, you just said, Maybe we're even developing an app for institutions. Maybe, you know, maybe Twitter is it. Um, I, I have some hope. Um, I don't have a huge amount of hope, but I have some hope that it's at least a, a part of a story. So I'd see the idea of, of using technology to get universal financial access as being the latest in a long run um, of uses of technology to improve the quality of life for people in poor countries. Well, I guess I would be very optimistic here. I'm uh, coming from the Gates Foundation. I'm a technology optimist like many of uh, my colleagues on the West Coast. And I, I think that um, we've been thinking about development uh, from a direct service provision mindset for so long. And we should be very, very excited about the fact that the majority of the people we care about that we're trying to reach now have a mobile phone. And we can think fundamentally differently about how we reach them um, and with what types of services. So I'm very optimistic about mobile in particular. And, and what we're seeing is that with this simple device, you can think about banking without the banks. You can think about education without the schools. You can even think about health care services without the public health system. So I wouldn't want to suggest that uh, we can replace a lot of the direct services, but I'm, I'm fundamentally an optimist and, and very um, aggressive, at least within USAID, about uh, the opportunity to push technology solutions. Um, and especially, you know, what's interesting, and I uh, had one of our economists verify this this morning, or, um, you know, 72 percent of those people living under two dollars a day don't live in a developing country. We're, these people now live in middle and even high income countries and that just puts a different face on who we're talking about sometimes. So, uh, so we can think about reaching those people who live in economies where services are getting better, where institutions do exist, obviously there are failures in them, uh, but, but trying to reach them with uh, direct uh, payments and services information via technology is um, is really a compelling idea, and I think we're at a unique moment in history to think to think about this uh, very strongly. And all right, Eric, just on that okay. first question, then we'll yeah move well, on. I think when we think about technology, there's a tendency to think of technology as being things that are new, but some of the goals of development today are the same ones that they were in 1960 or probably when Socrates and Aristotle were writing about how to transfer um, to the poor uh, around you or in, uh, in the Bible, of course. Um, and so, for example, taking the example that, that uh, was brought up about um, the vaccines. So what's the point of a vaccine? It's to prevent getting a disease. There's an alternative way to prevent getting a communicable disease, and that's to wash your hands, that's to drink clean water, that's to stay home. It just turns out a vaccine is a much cheaper way of doing that. And so wearing, wearing my economist hat, I guess, from a perspective of development, when we've got some predefined goals about how to improve societies or add justice or reduce corruption, um, what technology can often do is just make something cheaper, cheaper to do, an old way, uh, but making it, uh, in effect, more affordable. Um, and so sometimes this will generate us able to do something that we weren't able to do before. Um, and other times it might just reduce the cost so that we could provide more of it. Take um, all-weather roads. You can provide more transportation than you could with dirt roads with a certain amount of traffic. And then taking a, a step back, another step back from um, technology as products versus technology as a way to uh, improve on, on, on things in general. When we look at the total factor productivity of a country, which is kind of the basic measure at a macro level of, of the amount of ideas and technology in that place, it's not only new ideas and new gadgets, but it's also the ability to deploy those to the human and physical capital in order to uh, generate economic growth. And from that perspective, 
not just new apps, but also new ways of managing um, an economy can also be thought of, of uh, as technological uh, progress. So some of the what we might get to later on in the conversation is how te the technology of governance or the technology of uh, administering or managing a government and a bureaucracy and an economy uh, has how changes in, in that technology has affected our ability to uh, do economic development as well. Um, Priya, one of the points that you, you uh, I think, wanted to emphasize, and, and I'd like you to elaborate on this a bit, is the way in which uh, this direct to people cash, cash transfers uh, can function as a form of gender empowerment. Um, do you want to talk a little bit? I mean, Henry touched on this a bit as it related to Brazil and, the, and giving that money to female heads of households. But mm -hmm. do, you, can, do you want to talk about that? Yeah, well, I mean, I think it's, um, it, you know, this really can change the gender equation quite literally. I mean, in, in a matter of seconds, uh, increase the value of a woman uh, in her household or in her community. So I think that's, you know, one point that, I, that was maybe touched on a little bit in the paper, but I think... Um, it w was something I was most excited about because as we're thinking about mobile banking um, and, and therefore which would allow for more electronic forms of cash transfers, we're looking at a lot of countries like Afghanistan where, where the woman simply is not valued um, in, in her community unless you can change that equation dramatically. So I, I guess I just wanted to, to say that it was, in, in my mind, an underemphasized uh, part of the paper that, um, that, should, uh, that makes the idea even more compelling. I just want to um, jump in on that. Um, I was uh, distantly involved in a conditional crash transfer program in Yemen. Um, which was, uh, the con condition was that the kids went to school um, and the transfer went to women. Um, and the people handing out the cash, and it wasn't done by mobile phone, it was done using the armored trucks. Um, the people handing out the cash uh, uh, were really very heavily armed because men would come and say, you're not giving that money to my wife, you're giving that money to me. And so you know, it just speaks to, uh, there is a social element here, and actually that would make me push... Wait, and so, what, so what was the... Did it then call, cause sort of disturbances in social structure because then when the women got home? Or did it actually, did it work to help I mean, these I, women? Um, I, I don't think we know the answer to that yet. And actually, I mean, you know, it's, it's sort of where I, would, I want to come on to. I mean, um, I, Henry said that this wasn't about paternalism. I, I would argue with that a bit. I think it is at least about soft paternalism. And even soft paternalism in, in Yemen can sometimes get you in trouble. Because indeed, there is this question, you know, what happened when the women got away from um, the immediate area where they got the money? what happened then, and, I, and, and, and the short answer is, I'm afraid to say, we don't know. Um, uh, and, and there is a, you know, there's a question whether it was, it was, it was good or bad. Um, but I do think that the, that the conditional cash transfers do sort of fit into the you know, post-nudge world, if you will, um, of, of soft paternalism. I think uh, it is talking about encouraging people to behave differently. And frankly, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think there is a, a demand side to development, if you will. There is a need to change people's um, opinions about what's normal, um, about what it is that should happen. So you know, girls should go to school, kids should get vaccinated. And conditional cash transfers are a tool to do that. I think they, they can, in certain circumstances at least, be a really quite sustainable tool to do that. Take the example of education. Once parents start sending their kids to school, they tend to be very loath to take them out of school again. And once a kid has been to school and grows up to have kids of their own, if that's the best determinant of whether you go to school is whether your parents did. And so you don't need to keep the conditional cash transfer going to education forever. Once you've created a generation where education is the new normal, you can move your ca conditional cash transfer on to something else, if you will, um, you know, maybe, maybe to, a, to, to a savings regime or something. So I think it can be a very powerful ta uh, tool, but I think we have to admit that it is paternalism. I think it's, as I say, good, soft paternalism, but it's still paternalistic to some extent. Just so jump I, on I think it's uh, really yeah. interesting you say that because I hadn't um, had that impression when I read the paper. So as I was thinking about it, I was making the parallel in my mind 
that uh, of um, the way we used to get information. So when the internet was um, rolling out across America and, um, and teachers and parents were freaking out about how kids were going to get information, all of a sudden it was going from a highly regulated structure of getting information where you get information from your parents, from your school, from authorized sources, and then all of a sudden we were entering this scary world where you were going to get information from all sorts of people and you don't know. And it was like you had to trust that people could uh, sift through information, even kids um, sifting through all this new information that comes to them. In the same way, I think that's the policy question we have to ask ourselves about aid. Could we trust a model where we're not having uh, aid go through these highly regulated uh, programs where um, it's a bunch of contractors coming in, giving the, giving the service, building the school, but we actually let go and we say, have the money, you do it. And, and to me, it was quite a different reaction. I understand how the conditional uh, part of it can, can be seemingly uh, paternalis paternalistic, sorry, but um, as you say, these uh, can wind down and don't necessarily represent all of cash transfer. So I, I just had a fundamentally different um, reaction to it and thought it was uh, quite uh, revolutionary to think about letting go and just just give them the money. Oh, I mean, <laughs> I, I, unconditional cash transfers yeah. are, are very exciting and I mean, indeed yeah. there ought to be a lot more of them. I mean, one place we really ought to be seeing them at the moment is in, in the Middle East. Uh, if ever there was an opportunity to set up a program like they have in Alaska where the oil money goes straight mm -hmm. to the people, I think right now in the Middle right. East would be the moment right. to do it. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, so, so I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm hugely in favour of unconditional cash transfers. Yeah. But when it comes to the conditional ones, I, I, yeah. I think we have to we have to admit, own up, and say, but we still think it's a good thing that there's an element. Of and I think it would be fascinating to really understand the the difference. You know, the, what's the impact? What's the uh, cost effectiveness of adding the conditionality mm -hmm. when you have to verify how yeah. we use it. I mean, that's a huge question that's in my question. mind. Eric Sorry. needs some soft paternalism. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> I, I think we're forgetting the two largest cash transfer programs in the world today. I'll start with the second largest, which is social welfare in rich countries. That's unconditional cash transfer. If you're poor, if you're old, if you're sick, you get money. Well, I guess Medicare would be conditional on being sick, right? Um, and that works just fine, and we have a social contract, and that's part of the way we uphold it, is by if you're in a country that has enough income, you get money for just not being uh, wealthy enough to make other people comfortable in that uh, society. Um, we also have um, more paternalistic programs in the United States, and it's called public good provision. And then there's also private goods that get provided in a paternalistic fashion, like, you know, um, whatever, community engagement, um, social work, etc. You know, you could go down the list that a lot of us in this room might be uh, unfamiliar with. But these are, I think, the most basic kind of, uh, of, of cash transfer that exists in rich countries. And so taking this to the foreign aid um, arena is a very logical sense because we spend more money in transfer programs in the United States than we do out of the basic, um, at least federal budget. And so having there be a ratio of public good provision versus social safety net seems uh, entirely reasonable. I'm with you. There is a scale issue there. Um, if sort of total development spending is around $100 billion a year. Uh, there are, say, 700 million people on $1.25 a day around the world. You know, do the math. It's sort of 30 cents a day you could give them if you spend all aid on transfers. Now, 30 cents a day to somebody on $1.25 a day is a real amount of money and will have an impact. But I, I think we sort of need to be realistic that given the scale of aid as a percentage of the global economy as compared to the scale of welfare in the United States compared to the U.S. economy, what we're going to achieve with just straightforward transfers will be more limited. Right. Well, one could begin with unconditional targeted. There we go. Yes. Do an experiment, <laughs> etc. But, but let me mention the largest form of uh, individual cash transfers. And this is the biggest form of redistribution in the world, and that's within the, f within the family, mm -hmm. within the household. Um, all of you have depended on your, your family at various points in times and, and have folks in your family who depend on you. When that happens to cross a, a border and when that happens to go from a rich country to a poor country, we call that remittances. Remittances is already about three times the magnitude of, of regular foreign aid. 
Um, one could imagine, uh, and I wrote about this uh, maybe three years ago, uh, a program in which incentives would be devised to direct those remittances in such a way that fulfill other developmental goals or that could increase the flow. Of course, as with any intra-household or intra-familial transfer system, you're stuck because sometimes, you know, rich people help rich people, even uh, in, at, a, at a global level. And so there could be networks that it essentially run out and leave a lot of people uh, out of the loop with that particular mechanism. Um, mm -hmm. Eric, I want to get probe that point a little bit or, or maybe take it in a slightly different direction, which is so remittances are individuals uh, – giving money to other individuals and their family or friends or whatever it is. Uh, the kind of ca cash transfers you talk about the governments are doing are within a single nation. It's a nation making a decision for itself, the government making a decision for itself. It seems to me that once you talk about a foreign entity coming and injecting cash into a society, that it's a very different problem. And also, and I, this is where I'd like you to turn to corruption, that Perhaps the condition, uh, we're talking about conditionality, the condition for a government allowing this to happen in their nation is that the government itself gets to skim off the top. And are we able going to be able to do something where, where the Gates Foundation or, or USAID is going to be able to come in and say, we're going to give $100 million here and know the government of, of country X cannot touch it. It's just going to direct your people. Or is any government in the world going to allow that to happen? Well, I think that's why Charles um, highlighted the... Um, idea of re redistributing resource rents from oil within a society. Because part of the argument for that, which was developed by some of his colleagues at the CGD, um, is that it in reinforces that um, governor-governed bond, whereby in, in return for um, paying taxes, one gets services from the government and, and, and makes a society more um, responsive to the needs of its citizens. And to have a foreign entity, as you suggest, do this could disturb that dynamic. Um, we do see examples where governments take foreign charity in that sense, even when it would be ultimately their responsibility in that state-citizen um, um, relationship, and that's in disaster relief. Um, I think quite often um, many countries that are sufficiently poor will prefer to take um, this disaster relief from foreign um, aid agencies or NGOs, even though it's an admission of their inability to provide for this fairly basic national um, um, good, essentially public good, which is mass, massive insurance for, for, for uh, catastrophes that, are, that no individual should necessarily be able to self-insure for. And so um, utilizing, yeah, to do this on an international scale, um, W one would need to think very carefully about tapping into those uh, state-citizen relationships. Uh, I'll give kind of, I feel like I'm in the hot seat because I'm the U.S. Mm -hmm. government <laughs> representative here. But, um, you know, I work in an agency where 89% um, of people in the agency believe in the development work we do, and yet 39% think we're effective. So... Between these two, uh, <laughs> these two statistics, it shows the level I think that's of the U.S. government difficulty. standard, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> the difficulty um, of doing aid and um, and doing aid well, and I don't want to be dismissive of the decades of experience um, and and progress that have been made since 1990. Hundreds of millions of people are out of poverty. Uh, a third less um, children um, die before the age of. Five. So a lot of progress has been made, but we are forced to think about uh, cost effectiveness, especially in this budget environment, in a fundamentally different way. And so while I don't immediately see us saying, let's just give the money through accounts, um, we are looking at ways in which we can um, can divert some of um, our assistance through different means. So right now, even today, I've been part of intense policy discussions about Afghanistan. Afghanistan is a country where 90 percent of public expenditures come from outside donors. The U.S. government is a huge percentage of that. And, uh, and the p civil servants who are paid in Afghanistan, uh, many of them are paid in cash, and that's our money 
that's going to pay these civil servants, ours being U.S. government uh, taxpayer money. Um, and uh, when you pay them in cash, uh, you lose something like 30, 35 percent of uh, of that salary payment because there's so much skimming on the top. So the corruption issue is huge. So here we are uh, in the throes of a discussion about how can we put those in electronic form, reduce the leakages, and and I think you'll see from our side a lot more um, activity to promote mobile banking to get um, even in Haiti where we've uh, launched a challenge last year which has resulted in over 70,000 people using mobile banking. Many of those who are cash for work employees who are getting their um, you know, rehabilitation assistance uh, through electronic means. So uh, I don't know that we'll get to the point uh, this year or next where we would send money directly, but we're f we are fundamentally changing how we think about effective channels for uh, directing our aid. If, if the U.S. government is not going to be in the position of sending money directly and in this perhaps these experimental programs that we've talked about, who, who might do that experiment? Who, is the, the U.N. likely to do it? Is the f big foundation likely to make an experiment like this? <laughs> Gates? <laughs> She doesn't speak for Gates anymore. <laughs> That's what you can answer. Yeah. <laughs> hmm. I don't know. I, I really don't know, actually. And, but I, I, I would agree that the, um, that the impact studies that are coming out um, are really important to get building the political will. Yep. Sorry, I, I just thought that, that Mercy Corps actually was in Haiti yeah. using USAID money and <laughs> channeling it to people through the mobile exactly. phone. Exactly, they so are. So, what, but uh, what I'm the, and I think that's um, exactly the direction we're going. Okay. What I'm saying is that if we were going to instead say, here from Washington, are gonna, we're going to pay um, a, a Haitian, okay. you know, so tent dweller. So the answer is kind of uh, USAID through uh, an intermediary can do this. Um, it's just USAID directly couldn't. Yeah, and I think, I mean, you know, our first step, our, our real goal is to get people accounts. You know, the statistic in the paper that says 25% of the $140 million that receive cash transfers have an account. We need to get people into the banking system with mobile banking accounts, with bank accounts, traditional bank accounts, in order for um, for these transfers to be cost effective. And that's our number one goal, is getting people into the formal financial system. Let me argue that we also need to do it at a more metaphorical level, which is to, right now when you can do an evaluation of a program, you say, is this worth it or not? You, you, does it pass an economic rate of return of 8%, 10%, 15%, 15%—whatever? And then you have an economic hitman say says it does. But uh, ultimately, that counterfactual should not be that money, you know, sitting in a bond somewhere. But the counterfactual should be, what if we just gave it to people? We know that the individual return on capital can be extremely high. Um, some economic studies have found that for businessmen in Kenya, it can be triple digits, and so that sort of puts a bar on our formal programs for the economic return that we should uh, we but should so, expect. Sorry, so you're saying if when you're looking at a program which which is Roads. building a road, yeah. that the road the theoretical return on the road is ten percent, but in fact, if we if we're handing this money to these Kenyan businessmen, they're turning around and getting 200% returns on it. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, and there's, you know, wow. there's some financial return versus social return, but we should try to raise the standards of the programs we do so that the counterfactual would be just... We used to say helicopter, helicopter. drop, but now we can say <laughs> uh, electronic uh, mobile phone transfers uh, to individuals. Slate, just, uh, just as a caveat, as a warning on that, we just ran a piece th this week about some Sudanese Ponzi scheme, which where $180 million of money disappeared in some crazy postal Ponzi scheme. So it's, people can people will misspend money too. Um, the, sorry, Eric, did I interrupt you? Or no, no. Okay. So, I mean, just on on, on that, I, I I do think that this is a way to reduce um, uh, uh, money going missing, um, turning it electronic. But uh, you only need to look at you know 
Bernie Madoff uh, to realize that actually people can steal money even when uh, we've got electronic systems. So yeah. um, while I do think it certainly reduces transactions costs and can potentially reduce um, nefarious uh, 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 acts of uh, stealing it, um, it doesn't necessarily. And in some cases, of course, it can make it easier because all you have to do, rather than carry around all this huge cash, all you have to do is press his button and it's disappeared. So, you know, we need to be, we need to be a bit careful there. And sort of to come back out a bit again, I think we have to be a bit careful um, too that while technology is hugely powerful um, as a force for development, um, we, we shouldn't sort of put all our eggs in the te technology basket and just say everything, you know, everything will be okay. Um, right. Bill Gates, your former employer, um, actually you know, speaks, speaks quite eloquently on that, on the subject of computers and how you know, the idea that actually what we need to do most of all in rural Africa is set up a rural telecenter with a whole load of computers wired up to the internet is nuts. Um, uh, his words, not mine. Uh, uh, that, that, you know, in order to be able to use the internet really effectively, you need a whole load of other things as well. You need literacy, you need content, uh, you, you need good health, he mentions. Um, if you're trying to order on FedEx, it helps that there is a, a road to your village that the FedEx truck can drive along. You know, there are a whole load of other things you need as well in order to benefit from some technologies um, like uh, internet-enabled computers. So you know, technology is great, but that doesn't mean we don't need to evaluate and think you know, really hard about how we use it and, 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 and do all of the things that, you know, make up a good aid program. Um, Charles, you're, you have a book which is all about, it's, it's, it's utopian, not utopian, but it's optimistic. It's an optimistic book which says everything's getting better. So we've talked about this mobile technology. So what are other examples of where you, you talked about it briefly in your, as you, in your opening uh, remarks, but what are other examples of where, in the particular case of development and foreign aid, where technology is benefiting the world in significant new ways? Um, in communications technologies alone, and beyond, beyond the mobile phone, which has had, name your impact, it's had it. Uh, uh, television, an old, oldie but a goodie, um, uh, has, has had a, a very big impact on uh, social relations within the household. Um, uh, women uh, watching soaps, uh, uh, which features strong female characters, uh, end up, um, actually saying, hang on if them, why not me? Um, and it changes household relations and leads to things like more girls enrol girl enrollment in schools. Uh, interactive radio, where you use radio instruction combined with, with, with teaching, face-to-face um, -face teaching, and it has huge impact on, on, on literacy and learning outcomes. Uh, in health, there are a bunch, um, you know, vaccines or rehydration therapy, uh, um, and the list goes on. But if... It, you know, it's, it's bigger than that even. Uh, so we've got, we got plastic sheeting, we've got nails, we've got uh, 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 plastic containers, um, all sorts of you know, really simple things we just don't think about here. Solar lighting, uh, all sorts of really simple technologies we don't think about here have spread ubiquitously in some of the poorest parts, most rural areas of a developing world, and have had a really big impact on the quality of life. And sorry, and aid has had a big role in, in rolling out those, I mean, especially with uh, some of the medical technologies. Aid has paid for most of the rollout. There's a, there's a great, um, one of my favorite podcasts is this 100 Objects That Change the World. Mm. And they are the, the 100th object they just picked um, is uh, a solar-powered personal lamp, oh, which, cool. which people can now, they can now study at night. They can now, they don't have the darkness. It's very, and they don't need to be on the grid. It's a, it's a wonderful. And they don't need to buy more expensive paraffin, which um, makes them very ill when it right, uh, gets right. all smoky and right. burns yeah. their house down when they knock it over. It's just great. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I think what's interesting is um, is combined with those objects are um, the business models that we now have in mind to reach and serve um, even the most remote population. So on um, on the solar lighting issue is the the emergence of the uh, microgrid power sector, where you build uh, microgrids and lease out the bulbs for a dollar per month per household or, you know, um, and, and we have a new way of um, commercializing these objects and basic services, whether it's banking or lighting um, uh, for, for the most vulnerable, the, the most remote. So it's quite, quite exciting to compare, to put those two together. Yeah, though maybe I'd point out where sometimes these technological developments allow us to bypass the more systemic change that could actually bring about a change in society. 
So taking a, a you know the solar powered flashlight. Well, this might reduce people's demand to get hooked up to a grid, which can actually allow kind of cheaper and larger energy that would be required to get them out of you know studying for primary school versus being able to run a business um, out of their village. Um, from the technology of governance side, um, the particular way of, of, of a special economic zone, it used to be just you manufactured it was an area and a port, and over time this has been, we've seen new iterations about the technology uh, management and institutional technology of being able to have exporting firms um, you know, thrive in this special delineated ring-fenced area. But let's remember also that a special economic zone is a way to um, get around the fact that the, the whole business climate is kind of messed up and needs a particular ring fence solution uh, to allow firms that otherwise wouldn't locate there. And so you could have a potential byproduct of some of these developments um, where you avoid the first best solution by finding an easy way, uh, a quick fix in a sense, that reduces the incentive to try to, to get out of that equilibrium. Have you noticed you're, I mean, you're working in Liberia, which is a country which has had, you know, a very dynamic new leader after a lot of problems. I mean, is, is do you think that the institutions at the top level of that society can change in the way that these smaller technological uh, fixes are, are affecting the bottom? You know, I think at, at that level there's there's enough of a gap between where Liberia is and where the president uh, president. Uh, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf is trying to take it that um, maybe the actual incentive of a, of, a, of a bundled, cheaper way to avoid a, a fundamental change wouldn't actually be a factor because the need for um, fairly basic um, improvements in institutions and electricity is so great that, you know, if, if we got a micro hydro plant up in one village, the, the grid is, is still so far away from, from, from leaving the capital city that I wouldn't see that as getting in the way of, of more fundamental reform. Um, but in Liberia, I have seen some very basic uh, technological um, advancements in aid have real effects. You know, um, government workers getting paid through direct deposits. You know, there's, there's a simple problem of ghost workers, that especially if you've gone through a few different regimes over a couple decades, then there's all sorts of people who are on the payroll who might not actually exist um, and they could have been a way for a certain person in a previous administration to, to siphon money off. Um, so matching, you know, identification technology with a direct deposit um, not only prevents the payroll, the paymaster from, from taking a cut, but it also allows one to identify all these previous um, folks who may have been, um, or non-folks who may not have existed uh, <laughs> in the first place. Um, in the forestry sector, um, in Liberia, here's where a case of monitoring, which is one of the basic um, uh, functions of, 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 of governance, um, can, has been improved. Um, there's tropical forestry is, is one of the prime areas where monitoring is an issue. And we hear of just, you know, thousands of hectares of land just getting, um, you know, irresponsibly uh, logged in an unsustainable manner. Um, so what the government did in Liberia, working with USAID, um, and, and a Swiss firm, SGS, that basically measures stuff, um, was come in, come up with a chain of custody system where, you know, it's not necessarily high technology, but it's this very um, complex computer supply um, tracking system where every single log gets surveyed and then tagged before it's exported. And so, you know, that's the kind of thing that a bunch of engineers will will sit around and say, well, how can we manage this massive number of things in, in the cheapest way possible? And, and that's what they've come up with. And Liberia is actually one of the world leaders, um, or it is the world leader in this chain of custody system for, for tropical logging. Uh, we're going to go to questions in one second. Is there anything you guys want to add before we go to questions? No? All right. I'm going to change. I'm going to aggregate questions this time because I think that will be easier. So. Uh, well, I'll just collect a few. So, yes, Miss, right here, you can go first, and I'm, I'll write them down. And okay. Hi, um, Jessica, I work for Bridging the Divide. Um, first of all, um, our organization works on something very similar. We also believe in the fact that technology can 
um, create more effective and low-cost uh, foreign assistance. Um, we work on a slightly different model that is citizen to or, or organization overseas or activist. Um, I'm curious, this is, I, sorry, another uh, government department, uh, sorry, government-based <laughs> question, but I'm curious as to what extent you see these new technologies and these new systems, if they are in sense supposed to disintermediate foreign assistance and cut out some of the bureaucracy, how that might affect the structure and the role of USAID or the State Department, how you might see that changing that system. Okay, all right, and next question. Yes, right here, sir. Um, I would like to discuss the, oh, sorry, I'm Paul Larson. I'm with L3 MPRI, and I'm a student at George Mason University's Institute for Conflict Analysis and Resolution. I would like to touch on where the money is actually coming from. If this is a local government program where the actual local governance is giving money to the people, then that does potentially have the um, developing the citizenry in relationship with the government. But then you still have the issue of the United States giving a direct fund to the government and there's still a, a place for corruption to, uh, to happen. So that's one issue with the local government giving the direct funding. But on the other hand, if you have the U.S. government directly giving funds to locals, then you're going to completely undermine the legitimacy of the local government. So how do you balance between those two? And I, th I think that the only way that you would be able to do it without completely circumventing the legitimacy of the government would be through going through domestic institutions. But that still leads to the problem of corruption. So I don't see how you're getting around that issue. Um, Yes, back there behind you. Yeah. Good afternoon. My name is Allison Johnson, and I actually just wanted to ask um, questions um, revolving both the first panel and the second panel in a way. So first, just to have a correction about the M-Pesa program that you were referring to in Kenya, because um, I know she's shaking yeah. her head <laughs> that it was actually founded by a Kenyan entrepreneur Forgive me. in the yeah. private sector. Uh, so I wanted to at, use that as a way to sort of pose a question about the role of the private sector. Because one of the things that struck me uh, in, uh, in Ms. I, well, I can't see, any, see anyone's name, but the professor, my, the professor from HBS, uh, was the whole issue around the examples from the rich world of you know the transfer programs that we have because it really flipped everything you know social security and medicare and medicaid and you know all those are transfer programs and i was like wow i never thought about it that way but then you also see the negative sides of that at least in the usa i can't speak of the european union because i don't live there but here we sort of see the heaviness of all that's a lot of our 3.7 trillion dollar budget right so i'm thinking about the sustainability of trying to do conditional cash transfers in the developing world. Because I'm trying to envision what will their, you know, what will their challenges look like in 20 to 40 years if this kind of program, these kind of programs continue with our example of our almost $4 trillion budget, most of it cash transfers. So, you know, how does this look over time? Um, and then the other question was, uh, with the example from the first panel about the Bolsa Familia in Brazil, you know, I don't understand why, like in the USA, our welfare system, which is sort of familiar, uh, similar to Bolsa Familia, it, it never worked that well, right? It's, it's never been sort of this shining example for the whole planet about how you transfer money or, you know, do conditional cash transfers. So, you know, I, that's first panel, but if anybody here could talk about, you know, why did it, why did it work in Brazil? Why, why do you think it'll work in the rest of the world, but it never worked here? Thanks. And, and there's one more question right here, and then we'll answer them. Um, the one thing that I haven't heard about is the political implication of that transfer system. Um, I have I've gone and done democracy programs in developing countries and in it and it would seem to me that if someone is getting money directly from the US in any kind of way would make them suspect and it would directly into their banking system or whatever, that it would not be a safe thing for these people to get. So I have no idea, I mean, instead of having an intermediary <coughs> with, the, with the government. So I guess I'm kind of uh, going and matching my question to the gentleman up there, too. What, what does that mean? What are the political implications for that? 
the democracy implications besides the economic ones. Great. Okay. So why don't we? Um, so I see three sort of separate categories of question here. So the first one, we'll just take it in the order, um, which I, I guess more is for you, Priya. Which is, so if you you do start to have a significant amount of aid that's going directly from government to people, or that's not sort of moving through big U.S. government bu bureaucracy. Um, does that affect what, what happens at the State Department or at your agency? Um, well, I think uh, just first of all, I think the, this whole trend towards cash transfers um, and the new impact studies that are coming out is really forcing state and aid and other agencies to think about uh, the impact of our work and and how to cut down on the bureaucracy. So there's a series of reforms that we're going through to to get more money into local institutions, to um, cut down on the paperwork for uh, for contracting, all sorts of fundamental reforms in how we work. And and I, I do think that um, a lot of that stemmed from the fact that we're realizing how uh, how ineffective it, it can be. Not that it always is, but and 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 maybe I'll kind of touch on the second question. So I I don't think what we're what I'm saying is that we're fundamentally reorienting the portfolio for cash transfers, but that in places where we have a lot of transfers already happening. So in the case of Afghanistan, the fact that U.S. government tax dollars are paying so many of the civil servant salaries in Afghanistan. We should want those to be, um, those salary payments paid ele in electronic form. In Haiti, where we are paying, we in the height um, after the earthquake, we were paying twenty five thousand uh, workers a day, Haitian workers a day, <laughs> to help uh, with rubble removal and basic uh, response to the larger urban urban disaster. We we should be paying those people rather than in cash in electronic forms, which is um, going to uh, improve uh, outcomes for them and for us. So I, d I don't think want to suggest that we're, we're changing the way of uh, ODA quite yet, but we really are thinking very hard about, um, about the channels through which we, pe we uh, reach people with payments. Where, um, and so I hope that kind of touches on whose money is it. Um, so in the case of Haiti, that's, um, that's our money that we would put in for uh, reconstruction and rehabilitation in an emergency environment in Afghanistan. That's money that we, uh, we give to the Afghan government for budget support for them to pay their civil um, servants. Um, and in both cases, we have a real interest in making sure the leakages are reduced, um, um, or if not um, eliminated. Um, so Eric, I'm going to sort of throw the second, the second and fourth question, which were very similar to you. So this, the question being the, going back to this question of the political implications of a transfer system. If you send the money through a government, the government will skim. We may have the same problems that we've, we've historically seen with a lot of aid. Uh, and if you, if the money comes directly from the U.S., um, it may be that it's that it renders the aid suspect or or. Uh, people don't want it, or they say they're, or it, or it uh, fractures the relationship of a citizens to their own government. Sure. So I guess this comes to another question of technology and aid, which is, um, how do you deliver foreign aid when you don't trust the domestic institutions to do it, and your alternative is very expensive contracting with subcontractors and so on, the sort of chain of uh, of um, contracting, and then that's I think. An open question for those of you in the audience, if you're looking to develop a new technology, um, find some intermediate solution. And what we have are, are these like parallel structures. You've got the World Bank's pro project implementation units. Um, Millennium Challenge Corporation sort of chose a similar path as a way to try to use domestic institutions, but also try to um, keep a close eye on the, on the dollars and cents. Um, so the technology of auditing and of contracting are two technologies that are in constant development. They're not very, you know, they don't hit, hit the headlines very often in terms of uh, very exciting uh, technologies, but they're absolutely fundamental to do development, whether it's cash transfers or whether it's building roads. Um, so I think that's sort of an open question uh, of how to do that. But I think, you know, I think your question points out the importance of 
going through domestic institutions when possible, even if that involves having some parallel um, way of monitoring and auditing uh, those financials. But we could step back and say, like, what's the correct social safety net for a country with a GDP per capita of $300? You know, what could you give someone in that society? An extra $10 a year? $20 a year? <coughs> and if so, is that going to make much of a difference? And in that environment, maybe for the first few <coughs> years, hopefully, under a growth scenario, um, having an external agent um, implement those cash transfers would be a comfortable way of especially if you have a government that isn't necessarily responding to the needs of its citizens, it's a dictatorship. You know, what would you do in that situation? Um, and having an external agent, uh, or say the U.S. government, whichever government, um, be the implementer of that scheme, where they do all this biometric, set up a global, you know, a census essentially of, of bank accounts of, of adult age people, and do the system could be the appropriate step. But then you say, well, what in this system is allowing them to improve the governance in that place in the same manner as if that government was doing it itself and responding to the needs and demands of its citizens. And there we have some fairly crude ways of doing it. Again, going back to Millennium Challenge Corporation, which I actually worked at a number of years ago. Um, what we chose to do there as the U.S. government was to condition being eligible for Millennium Challenge account funds by if you're already fairly well governed. And so one can create incentives for good governance in the absence of that government providing public goods or, or private transfers at, uh, of a social safety net uh, itself. And so I guess if, you know, we're all 45 minutes new into this topic, um, but, you know, um, I'm sure if this were, go were to be implemented at a larger scale, some sort of staging um, scenario where at first one incentivizes the government to behave well and then eventually that incentives is coming from the the voters themselves and in terms of the sustainability of it well having a budget deficit for providing something that people are demanding is probably okay you know because over time that budget deficit is going to go down you cut <coughs> bad things or you cut the things that are the least desirable by the citizens you might end up with a lower growth rate, basic political economy models of, of, of angry citizens demanding redistribution predict lower growth rates. We don't always see that empirically. Um, but there's, a, I think, in, in the long run, um, the sustainability can be determined by the preferences of, of the population. In the beginning or with a bad government, one could start with one of these intermediate kind of top-down incentive-based uh, games. Does, Charles, do you want to add anything to this? You've, you've Included the third question, which is this: Is our governments going to bankrupt them, bankrupt themselves by giving away too much money, and is that going to cause long-term problems of the sort that the United States seems to have? Um, is there anything you you would like to add to that? Just, just briefly, and, and particularly because I heard corks popping in the background. Um, <laughs> Actually, but people are going to have to wait a little, a little bit, bit longer. longer. Don't <laughs> don't get too excited. Uh, uh, um, I, I think um, with welfare, what's the counterfactual is, is one important question to ask. Um, do we know that when we say welfare has failed, do, do we really mean it? Do we mean that if we took away all welfare payments in the United States, poor people really wouldn't be worse off? I, I think they probably would. And when you take people who are on a dollar twenty-five a day or less, 90-some-odd percent of their expenditure is going to food. It's, it's just really hard to imagine there is going to be a huge amount of waste of them going off to Vegas uh, to uh, gamble the money away if you give them a little bit more. Some of it, 10%, maybe, that's what I guess Esther Duflo would claim, but 10%, you know, may get wasted. That's a, a lot less than some of the leakage we see. And just on the leakage point um, uh, of, of, of conditional cash transfers, one of the great things about conditional cash transfers is you're handing the money to people and you're telling them in advance that you're going to hand the money to those people. Those people suddenly have a huge incentive to make sure that money gets delivered because it's theirs. And so if you just set up a system where you tell the final recipient you're going to get this money, the chances that that money goes through the system is way higher than if you say, oh, sometime in the future we're going to build a road somewhere and it'll be you know, vaguely near your village. That's where you get problems. When people don't know what to expect, then there's a lot of space for um, uh, uh, leakage. If, if people know that they should be getting you know, a, dollar in, uh, a dollar on their mobile phone next week, 
they're much more likely to make sure that dollar gets there. Um, so I think actually from a, a leakage point of view, that's one of the ways, you know, having said I don't think it's a be all and end all solution, I think that's one of the ways it is actually quite powerful. Uh, all right. Sorry, Go can ahead. I say one yeah. more thing? I know I don't want to delay it much further, but you asked a great question, and I'm so excited about it, um, and I meant to touch on it. So you asked, can we imagine a world where um, this is a more of a P2P mechanism for, um, for getting money from the rich to the poor? And, and I think that's um, really exciting to imagine, and, um, you know, we're seeing more uh, national government payments to people. Maybe um, we'll see more international governments to people payments, but ultimately we could uh, look into the future and see kind of the real Kiva type of um, uh, uh, situation where you could find someone who, um, who you want to give to and you give it to them uh, directly. So I think it's, it was a really exciting comment uh, possibility there and um, I just wanted to recognize it. Thanks. That's great. Well, everyone can now know and expect that in exactly 10 minutes they will get alcohol. But <laughs> there's 10 more, and there will not be a road built to that alcohol. Um, but so first I want to thank um, Charles and Priya and Eric for a great discussion here. And, and now um, uh, Henry and Jamie are going to come back just to briefly do an epilogue, and then we will, we will imbibe. Word. That's nice. Yeah, we get the last word. This was a negotiation on my part because I thought some panel gets to come up here and comment on the idea and I don't get to respond to it. So uh, I think we need a couple of minutes. But I actually, um, I don't know how much Henry has to say. I'm hoping that it's less than 10 minutes until yes. we get to the alcohol. Um, I, would, I just have three comments um, from you know, the panel and also the Q&A that came afterwards. And then I'll just leave it to... Hank, to close this out. The first is the conditional versus unconditional. And actually, Priya, you and I had a really brief email chat about this and that really there isn't a lot of evidence that yet that tells us the difference between the impacts of those two things. Um, you know, you see a, a lot more impact evaluation on the CCTs. It doesn't mean that the unconditional um, don't have some really important impacts as well. And I agree with you completely that we should, uh, that we should study those things. Um, one thing I also wanted to mention, something that was discussed, uh, this idea of uh, intra-country, um, the CC, you know, basically the CCTs, but uh, government to person transfers through oil reserves. Uh, and we actually are experimenting with that um, in Nigeria at the moment. It's something that uh, we're working on here at the Global Assets Project um, within the Bayelsa State of Nigeria, working with the government on the first ever policy pilot on child development accounts where they are depositing um, uh, opening accounts for um, a, a small pilot group of children within the state um, and putting in an initial deposit and matching those deposits all in the condition of uh, um, enrollment and continued uh, um, attendance in school. And the idea of that is also, um, these are savings accounts, the idea is prolonged uh, human capital investment, and so continued education, uh, micro-entrepreneurship, technical training. Um, so we are seeing it. It's budding. It's tiny, tiny, tiny. Um, but we're hoping that this is will be an experiment that um, will provide some fodder for the folks over at the Center for Global Development and others who are thinking much bigger um, about this idea of uh, of you know taking the Alaska Permanent Fund model and and applying it um, to uh, resource-rich countries. And the final one is just uh, wanting to say that I totally take everyone's uh, kind of head-scratching confusion on, okay, there are lots of problems with this idea of you know, the United States government from this from the Washington, D.C., pressing a button and it going into an account. And I, and I get that, um, and I think that what we were aiming for here was to be as provocative as possible. Um, obviously, there are sovereignty issues, there are political issues, there are democracy issues, um, but I think Priya was right when she said, and what we're really trying to get at here is 
you know, forward thinking, big picture, and that the idea is, elect is the electronic, me electronic mechanisms that will reduce the cost of these transfers um, and are easy to monitor, um, are easy to target, um, improve their efficiency, and all the different uh, additional pieces, supplementary aspects of it that can also provide um, access to society, access to the economy, and access to pathways out of out of poverty. So I get it, and I'm I don't think that Henry or I would argue that any time in the near future it's going to be directly this idea, vision of uh, of money from one government into someone's account yet, but. You know, Kiva type model. I mean, these things you never know. Um, but the idea is really uh, the idea of reducing those costs and and through the elect through tapping into technology to to uh, take to leverage these new economic means of of doing. And even still, it, when doing that, you could still transfer to through through an intermediary, and it'd still be better than what we've got going on in seventy five percent, if not more, of the uh, of the programs that are running cash transfers today so yeah if I just pick up on that last case yeah we do it to be provocative because at one level it would be true but operationally of course not and there are many things you can imagine like the global fund for instance it could be several governments in the world capitalizing a single mechanism that at the cost of three percent can deliver 97 cents on the dollar to hundreds of millions of households. It's entirely possible. There's no big mystery. It would take a certain kind of coalition. So I mean, all those kinds of things to me are more detailed. The most important thing, and it's the statement, my first statement, and this is, what, is Charles still here? Oh, well, it's a pity, because you know, yeah. UN and World Bank, we love to have arguments. But the, you know, I mean, the thing is, uh, there is a thing about technology and concept. And this is a concept. Maybe it's easier if I say, when I was in Paraguay, the Paraguayans went to the big brothers in Brazil, and they loved the Bolsa Familia, and they came back and they implemented it, and they refused to listen to me, that if you don't have the financial transfer thing figured out, you must not do it. It can be the worst type of program, which is what I wanted to tell Charles Yemen was. Because anyone that's going around with buckets, buckets of cash and handing it out is defeating the whole purpose. And the whole idea of women, especially in Muslim countries, to have some form of possible privacy, because at least they have something that is theirs, and I agree we should have written a bit more about that. So I think it, technology is a determinant in this particular case. And only because of technology can we talk about it at the scale that I think is very much possible. In terms of scale, one of the arguments, and again, Charles said this, was that, you know, they poo-poo it. Well, if you look at all the numbers, you could never have enough aid for that. But, you know, it, 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 it's the way it started in Brazil, you know, over 10 years ago. And now it's one half of 1% of GDP. And there's not one Brazilian who would tell you that one half of 1% of GDP isn't a bad investment in this. And if you look at countries as they evolved, that some percentage of what they, what, they, what they have as an economy is devoted to this. So I don't think, I think there is a scale. I don't think ODA would be the solution, but I think it could be the catalytic force in which a lot of countries would see the purpose and the mobilization of funds that way. Um, I think what Eric is saying, the breakthroughs on, on auditing technology, and it's, it's not a joke. I mean, when you're talking about hundreds of millions of accounts or billions of accounts and the kinds of, you know, I had to do auditing in my career and, and the kinds of, you know, t samples and testing and how you can do it electronically puts us in a radically different place. And, and the leakage issue on these things are not, you know, I think I totally agree in there. I think Charles and I are in agreement. Um, so I think that the potential of this and, and maybe I should end in a big idea because I think one thing that you that you raised was, well, who's going to do this? Who, who would have a pilot? Well, I think Jamie and I hope, like others, that there's a community in our industry that realizes that there's a lot to be gained and no single UN or USAID or World Bank should do it. There should be some kind of a coalition to try and do the kind of empirical. And the only reason I can talk the way I am now is that there's 10 years of empirical proof in a very diverse country, like I said, it's five countries, um, that can give you a lot of data about a lot of the basic questions that people get scared by. And those questions can be answered. But really, it needs much more work. And hopefully that, you know, with, with the support of people like you and, and whatever, uh, there'll be a pressure for people to really take this seriously and, and work on this on a scale that's, that's potential to the impact. 
that we believe is possible. So I, I don't want to keep anybody away from the wine, much less myself. So I uh, thank you all very much. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you.